flying out of England. You want to next go down. That was our airfield at England. The, the scarred up place you see there, that's, a, that's our runway. There's a line that seems to go across the runway and then follows out down there. There was a creek that ran across the runway and they just piled a bunch of logs in the creek and laid about two and a half, three inch square steel wire mesh over the bare ground across the creek down to the left end of it here. Uh, tech orders for a P-47 called for 5,000 feet of paved runway. That was 4,500 feet of wire mesh. And we, got, we overloaded the airplane by as much as 1,000 pounds and still got it off the ground. The bright white stuff right there just to the south of the uh, runway, that's a horse and glider factory where they built the British horse and gliders. You see some of them parked up there, just the other side of that little bunch of uh, houses. At the end of the runway <coughs> was a little village of Muddyville, Muddyford. Mightyford. One day, two of my buddies and I were walking down the runway. You see where those kind of scallops are? Those are revetments where they park the airplanes. We were walking down there, watching one of the other squadrons take off, and one of their planes got up in the ground, in the air, the engine quit. He went down and hit the top of the house in Mightyford and crashed into that blank space you see there. A bunch of people came running down, to, and he burst into flame. You know, he had 700 gallons of 150 octane fuel burning there. People came running down there. We knew that there were bombs in that fire. So we were running over to try to chase the people away. One of those bombs cooked off. And we, it was probably 30 yards from where we were. The guy next to me was about arm's length away. His name was Arthur Williams, one of our pilots piece of shrapnel about so big hit him in the chest and went right through. He was killed right there. The guy on the other side of me, about another arm's length the other side, he had a, a piece of shrapnel hit his ear and it took a piece of his ear out. He recently retired as President Emeritus of the South Carolina Senate, Senator John Drummond. I was not badly hurt. I got scratched up a bit, but was in introduced to the concussion from a thing like that. There were 21 people killed in that explosion, and I'm wandering around in the middle of that carnage without the foggiest idea where I was or what I was doing. It was a good solid hour before I really began to regain my senses, and my ears still ring to this day. I sound like a head full of crickets. All right, now after the invasion, we moved across the, uh, the channel to uh, England, I mean to France. That's how we lived. We didn't have fancy living quarters. You did your bathing and shaving out of your steel hat, and there's somebody's got some water heating in a bucket on an open fire over there. The next picture also is how we lived. It's one of my buddies getting a new hairdo. Now, both those guys are pilots. The one doing the barbering wasn't a barber. He was a florist when he got drafted, but it didn't matter. He's just chopping off extra hair. <laughs> in the background, you can see a bunch of tents, you see that white stuff up there at the top? That's somebody's laundry hanging on a tree branch. That was an apple orchard. The runway there was as ridiculous as the one in, in fact, it was more so. They ran a bull, couple of bulldozers back and forth through that apple orchard a few times, tapped the dirt down, and laid heavyweight tar paper on it and sealed the edges with melted tar. And there's your runway, guys. And it wasn't 5,000 feet long, it was 3,800 feet. Now, we still overloaded that airplane by as much as 1,000 pounds and got it off the ground. You sat at the end of the runway and locked your brakes and opened the throttle and turned it loose in the way I described it. When I began to feel life in the wings, just pull the landing gear out from under it and leave it flying and go on out. And we always made it. Now, just to, between that, uh, guy getting a haircut in the little pup tent you see, one day there's a little girl standing there holding a bucket. She's about a 14-year-old kid. Our flight surgeon, Doc Milligan, spoke French. So he went out and he asked her, you know, what are you doing here? You're right in the middle of a combat outfit. The girl explained that she hoped when we finished a meal, if there's any food left, she could take some to her family because they were hungry. The 
war had killed all their animals, torn up their garden so they couldn't grow anything. We were living in an apple orchard and there was no fruit left on the trees. And they were afraid to get on the road to look for food because if they did, they're going to get killed. Our orders were, if you catch anything on the road or the rails moving, you shoot it. Our mess sergeant, the squadron cook, he was a Chinaman by the name of Singh, Sergeant Lee Singh. He said, Doc, you go tell that girl to come back with her family three meals a day. We'll take care of them as long as we stay here. So we had guests for our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. One day, Sergeant Singh came over to me and he asked me, Captain, would you do me a favor? Sure, Sarge, whatever you want. Well, on these pylons under the wings, we hung bombs. We could also hang external fuel tanks to extend the range of the airplane. One type of those tanks were made by the English. They held 108 gallons and were made of paper mache, which was liquid proof for maybe four hours. Sergeant Singh mixed up 70 gallons of powdered milk, dumped in 20 gallons of mixed proof cocktail, 25 pounds of sugar, three gallons of Cavados, which is a good tasting apple brandy they made in that orchard country, a few other spices, and got it all mixed up, poured it in one of those paper tanks, hung it on my airplane and said, now take that up where it really gets cold. <laughs> so I took off, I climbed up to 35,000 feet, and the outside air temperature is 45 degrees below zero, which is going to freeze that mixture pretty quick. Slopped the plane around like that for a half hour to try to keep it stirred up, rolled over and dived down and landed, and they dropped the tank off the wing, chopped it open with an axe, and we enjoyed Tutti Frutti ice cream. <laughs> that was expensive ice cream, because the engine in that thing burned 100 gallons an hour of 150-octane gasoline at cruising, 300 gallons at power. We didn't care. If the sergeant wants ice cream, he shall have ice cream. <laughs> now, have any of you been in the hedgerow country of Normandy? Okay, let me tell you about the hedgerows. In that first picture that we had, uh, you can see on the ground in dark lines, those are hedgerows. French farmers didn't separate their fields with barbed wire like ours. They built a berm, a mound of dirt, and plant trees and bushes on it, and that's what separates their fields. Some of those things have been there longer than we've been a country. They're pretty solid, and they pinned our soldiers down. A ground soldier looking over the top of one of those was likely to get his head blown off by a sniper. <clears throat> when our tanks tried to run through it, they'd run up over a berm and the belly of the tanks exposed. They got hit with an anti-tank weapon of some kind. So to get them out of there, they set a bunch of heavy bombers, B-17s and B-24s, and they just blew out. Let's go back to the map a minute. They just blew out about a four-mile square. I want to hope that you can see some of this. Now we were flying, when we moved across, we were flying out of Peekaville. How many of you saw the movie, The Longest Day, where a parachutist hung off the church steeple? That was San Maraglis. We were four miles from San Maraglis, within two miles of the uh, German front lines. They blew that hole out of the cotton team right in there. The bombers went in, blew out a hole. And General uh, Bradley got his army through from up here, through that hole, south of the hedgerows, headed east toward Paris. Excuse my hiccup. General Montgomery and his army is up here. That is St. Lo, the, uh, the headquarters for an entire German army right in there. And they were, uh, they were uh, trapped between, that's good, between uh, uh, Bradley and Montgomery. They got on the road at night to try to escape from that pocket. We didn't know they were moving. We took off just at dawn and flew a search pattern and came across a road, bumper to bumper enemy traffic as far as you could see. We turned and flew up to the head of the column and dropped a bomb on the lead tank and stopped them, called our squadron and told them what we'd found. They reported to the group and the group sick the other two squadrons on that German column. That's three squadrons, 36 P-47s pounced on them and created the wildest sky you could imagine. Any aircraft fire coming up all over the place, fires and explosions up and down the road, airplanes coming from every direction, and the radio traffic, a guy screamed, I'm on fire, I'm bailing out, I'm hit, I'm going down, I'm out of ammo, I'm going back, and right in the middle of that frenzy came a voice that said, I want my mommy. <laughs> you have to have a sense of humor to survive in that environment. 